Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be starting our conversation on thermodynamics by trying to define what the heck thermodynamics is, and then taking a closer look at the specific systems we can use to model thermodynamic changes. So when we're talking about thermodynamics, this is mostly going to be focusing on the idea of the transfer of energy, either to or from a reaction into the surroundings. And so there's many thermodynamic processes that we're actually quite familiar with. We don't often think of them as such though. One great example is the evaporation of water. So most of you, anyone who's done cooking knows that if I take water, I apply enough heat, I can make it turn to steam. I can send it into the gas phase. And we always think about this as I put a pan of water onto the, I put a pan of water onto a stove and I can make it evaporate. However, it turns out that this is true in general. And it, one of the old ways of trying to cool off a house before air conditioning was you would tie uh, wet cloths to a fan. And then as the fan blew air through those cloths, it would evaporate the water. And that too also took up heat from the surroundings and it was a way to cool a room. And so there's a lot of these heat transfers in ways that we don't often think about it. So a great example is that it turns out when you have condensation on your cold bottle water, not only is it attracted to uh, the cold water, so that cold object, but it turns out that it actually is eat, it ends up heating up your water as when you go from the gas to the liquid, so that uh, water vapor uh, condenses, it's generating heat, heating up your nice cool bottle of water. So if you want to keep your bottle cooler, uh, insulating it from the uh, surroundings doesn't just prevent heat loss, it also prevents heat loss through condensation. So taking a closer look at this idea of thermodynamics, one of the good places we can start is by defining the field. So pretty much anything that studies how heat or energy moves or behaves is thermodynamics. And this comes from the original Greek phase, as everything does, from therm, which is heat, and dynamis, which is power or work. So this is often uh, originally came out as studying heat power. And one of the reasons why is because thermodynamics really developed as a field in the early 1800s by studying steam engines. So the idea of a steam engine is you're pumping in hot, uh, hot steam, which causes an expansion where it pushes a piston and then you release the cold expended uh, vapor. And then you repeat this whole process. And this is really where thermodynamics comes from. And as a result, when we're going to be describing a lot of our chemical systems, we're gonna often come back to this idea of a piston because that's really where uh, thermodynamics developed was that study of pistons. However, this is still related to chemistry because it turns out that all of the energy to drive a piston came from chemical reactions. So uh, we're going to be specifically trying to focus in on chemical thermodynamics. So this is going to be the amount of energy consumed or produced by a chemical reaction. So a great example is the combustion of say natural gas or methane. You take methane, you combine it with oxygen and you produce CO2 and water. However, one of the big reasons why we do this reaction is you also produce a whole bunch of energy because uh, oxygen and methane are relatively unstable. CO2 and water are very stable molecules. And so as you go from unstable to stable, you produce a lot of energy. And this is gonna become a big feature of our conversation. However, it isn't, uh, thermodynamics isn't just for the fossil fuel industry. It also is a real fundamental driving force of biology because biology is, uh, is all about uh, metabolism. And biological metabolism is driven by many of these heat producing reactions or consuming reactions. So a quintessential example is respiration. You take in uh, glucose, you combine it with oxygen, you produce CO2 and water. You're essentially always 
combusting materials. You're just doing it slow enough, you can get the maximum amount of energy out of it to drive all of the other functions of your body. And this is also driven by other processes like the hydrolysis of ATP. This is called hydrolysis because you have an ATP molecule shown up here on the right, you add a water and you lyse or break these phosphate bonds. And this produces a lot of energy. And as a result, ATP is called the currency of life because this is uh, how we shuffle energy from one part of the bot uh, cell to another. And so all of these processes rely on an understanding of thermodynamics. However, trying to study the movement of energy all around gets really messy. So often what we do is we first try and define what specific thing do I care about? And we call this the system. So one of the easiest ways we can try and uh, define a system is by splitting the entire universe, everything exists into what I care about, which is what we call the system, and everything else, which is called the surroundings. So one of the classic first systems that everybody thinks about is what's called an open system. So this is something where you can allow matter and energy to flow freely. So again, think of our boiling pot of water. So I'm putting energy in through the stove, and I'm losing matter as water vapor. I also am introducing matter as extra air coming in, and I can lose some heat through the surroundings. And so this is what we often think about in real systems. However, it is important to note that aren't, we aren't just having uh, heat energy move and leave. We're also having a lot of energy leaving through that water vapor. That water vapor does contain energy. And as a result, open systems are very hard to study. They're the most uh, one we care about the most, but we often have to go to something simpler to try and, well, reduce the number of variables. So one of the classic ways we can do is simply not let matter move in or out. So the only thing I'm gonna do is let energy move in and out of my now closed system. So we do this all the time. So let's take that pot of boiling water, I can change it from an open system to a closed system simply by putting a lid on it. So whatever was in the pot stays in the pot in terms of matter. So no water is coming in or out. However, I can still have energy come in and out. I've got, he I've, I'm heating up the pot and some of that heat will leave through the sides and top. These are gonna be a lot simpler ways of trying to describe a system. So I can just look at how energy enters and leaves the system without having to worry about that whole matter component. And these are very commonly studied. As you might expect, the classic example is a piston. So often I have a closed piston. I uh, put energy in or out of the system. And as the energy moves in and out of the system, I may cause some sort of movement in the piston as it goes up or down, depending on how much energy and thus the temperature of the system. Uh, from a simple gas perspective, the higher the temperature of the gas inside the system, the higher the pressure, the more that piston moves. However, the simplest system that removes as many variables as possible is the isolated system. So in an isolated system, no energy or matter ends up getting in or out. So for this, best example is think about a cooler or a thermos. So it limits the amount of energy that can get in and out and prevents any matter from getting in and out. These are gonna be very simple to study and as a result, uh, and are, as it's very easy to quantify how much energy uh, enters or leaves because there is none. And so thus the energy inside should remain constant and known. And <clears throat> what we often do in terms of physics is we make use of these isolated systems by then placing another system inside. So I may have a closed system inside an isolated system. So I know how much energy is in my whole isolated system, and then I can move, watch it enter or leave, say, a piston inside my insulated container. So these are gonna be the big terms I'm gonna be using a lot. Closed, open, and isolated. Also, be very aware of this idea of watching how energy moves or leaves, and we're gonna start with simple things like pistons and work our way up to full chemical reactions. Next time, we're gonna take a little bit more closer look at what I mean by when I say energy. What are the types of energy and how can they move? Until then, take care.